Chairman, and thank you to our panel of witnesses uh, for being here today and making this hearing possible. I have read your testimonies. And ensuring our higher education and workforce systems operate hand in hand is incredibly important. And we must do more to make sure that our students are being encouraged to take advantage of all opportunities that are afforded them. Um, this only helps to better themselves, but also their finances and their families and economically our, the future of our communities, but also ensure that our people have the skills necessary to fill these in-demand sectors of the economy and help the American um, uh, communities compete. While there are other viable ways to get there, like a registered apprenticeship, a college degree, or credential, is still the best and most successful pathway uh, to economic security. And we're seeing that play out in real time in Georgia, at Georgia State. I do represent Georgia, and thank you so much um, uh, for being here today, where they have been ranked among the top institutions in the nation for helping students uh, to lift themselves not just out of poverty, but also into the upper half of the uh, earners uh, economically in the country. Almost 60% of Georgia State students are Pell eligible, and almost 80% of them are non-white, and they work while they're actually going to school. That's admirable. The education system is supposed to serve as a ladder for economic mobility, and GSU has learned uh, in this mission uh, to do that very thing, and uh, we've seen incredibly promising results out of Georgia State University. They've increased their graduation rate by 70% just since 2010. Uh, using this institutional aid program known as the Panther Retention Grants, they go out of their way to identify students who are at risk of dropping out because of the cost of the education and award them small grants to ensure that they stay enrolled and that they actually complete graduation. And I'm also glad to have them in my home state and here on the Hill today to show the rest of the country their important work. Dr. Renick, I have two questions for you today. At the beginning of the pandemic, the University System of Georgia sustained a 10% cut of roughly $230 million that was never, ever restored. The state recently went even further uh, and had additional cuts of $600 million from next year's budget, which translates to about $8 million cut for Georgia's largest university system, Georgia State. In your testimony, you mentioned that regional public universities are oftentimes stripped of their resources with large classes and overwhelmed staff. Do cuts like these um, make it more difficult for you to accomplish your mission and to get the positive results that we've uh, seen at GSU? We want to continue to see those results, and is this more difficult uh, because of these kinds of cuts? Yeah, thank you, Representative. Um, the, the, the budget challenges in Georgia and other states that the Institute I, I, I direct are working with are a day-to-day -day challenge. It's, it's shifting sands uh, from one month to the next. One doesn't know what the, uh, the, the budget will be, but typically they're, they've been going down as far as state appropriations are concerned. What we're doing is working at Georgia State to make sure that we pri prioritize the interventions we know by evidence to make the big difference. And we're happy to say that while students are struggling as they arrive at Georgia State in numbers higher than was the case prior to the pandemic, that we continue to set records for graduation rates even into the, the pandemic because these kind of systematic supports work. One thing I'm messaging to the presidents and the leadership of other institutions we're working with at the Institute, we have about 40 schools we're working with right now, is if you're facing budget cuts, where those budget cuts could best be made. And the, the knee-jerk reaction oftentimes is to cut the support staff, the, the advisors, the, the counselors, uh, the, the, the uh, financial aid uh, uh, staff, and so forth, which in many ways is, is shoot yourself in the foot because these are the very people on a campus who will help generate the tuition and the revenues that will sustain these institutions. Thank you. And I have one more question for you. Georgia State provides four-year degrees to uh, predominantly black and minority students uh, more than any other institution in the nation. In your testimony, you also mentioned efforts that you've taken to make this happen. Can you expound upon that just a little bit more for us about all the work that you're doing at Georgia State to ensure that students have access to strong education uh, and that they graduate on time and get connected to high quality, good paying jobs? 
Yeah, the, the reality is that over the last decade, Georgia State has conferred more bachelor's degrees to black students than any other college or university in the United States. So these approaches work. They work across the demographic spectrum. Uh, since we're short on time, what I'll say is a key part of our strategy is to take what used to be optional supports, where students would have to take time out of their day to seek help, to find an office, to, to, to connect with uh, a support, and hardwire that into the student experience. So every student who attends Georgia State will get exposed to career uh, uh, capabilities and to counseling, will get uh, access to tutoring and so forth, will get these uh, micro grants if they run into problems problems and are at risk of dropping out for financial reasons. These are just systematically delivered to all students. And when we did so, and we've run randomized control trials that confirm this, although the supports are available to all students equally, it's oftentimes the students from underserved backgrounds who benefit the most from that systematic approach, including our black students. Thank you, Malva. Time and go Panthers. Thank you. <laughs>